So some have said, if the Philippines is ancient Ophir, then why doesn't it have large ships in ancient times? Of course, the very question is a false narrative, because it's not true. History tells us otherwise, and we'll prove it in this video, even supported by archaeology. Welcome to 100 Clues the Philippines is the ancient land of gold known as Ophir in the Bible and history. No, it's no fable. This has already been proven in full in the God Culture Solomon's Gold series. At the request of many viewers, we have pulled out 100 compelling clues, really proofs or evidences, from this research in which we will highlight briefs of the most compelling points. And yes, there are over 100, and they are coming, don't worry. These videos are for those who have not had time to watch Solomon's Gold series and easy to share to friends and family, especially skeptics. This brief video cannot replace that 50 video series nor prove the way that it does, but this will be very effective nonetheless. So go there for full evidence, but now, Part 26 of our series, 100 Clues, the Philippines is Ophir, one clue at a time. See, when Picafetta, the Italian scholar who came with Magellan, and by the way, one of the most credible scholars, really of all time, he wasn't just an historian, he was the first historian to sail around the world. That's no small thing. Here's what he writes in his journal. You know, the one they don't bother to teach in schools other than minor excerpts because, well, why teach actual history as it's written when you can rewrite it and call it a textbook? Hmm. March 29, 1521. And he writes, And let us under a place covered with canes, where there was a balungai, that is to say, a boat, 80 feet long or thereabouts, wow, resembling a fusta. Now, obviously, this is in the Philippines. He saw this boat, and not just one of them you'll see. Okay, wait a minute. Did you know there actually so-called academics who read this and immediately dismiss this expert in history and sailing and say he just didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he, he, he couldn't measure. I mean, how could he possibly know how long 80 feet was? Gee, really? How did he know that it resembled a fusta? Who does he think he is? How could that Italian sailing historian who spent years on ships have any clue what a fusta was? Really? Right. And that's so-called academic. Duh is what we'd call it. He says it was a fusta in appearance because it was. See, he knew exactly what he was talking about. And for centuries, some historians have laughed this off, as this couldn't possibly be the Philippines. No way. Well, he didn't just record once, but on screen, here are just three references of many. He saw Balungai in Cebu, for instance, and he mentions them several times. Now, we'll deal with the 80 feet, because Pigafetta did know exactly what he was talking about, and those so-called academics are very wrong, have been proven wrong, indisputably so, and we'll get there. We'll show you, but what exactly is a fusta? A narrow, light, and fast ship. Notice this definition calls it a ship. With shallow draft, powered by oars and sail. In essence, a small galley. So a smaller version of Magellan's ship, essentially. Hmm. 
It typically had 12 to 18 two-man rowing benches on each side. Now, that's a good-sized ship, but 80 feet, that's large. Was Pickett Feta just making things up here? Was he embellishing and stretching the truth? Not at all. And we'll show you. For in recent times, this Belungai has been unearthed. We have archaeology to prove it. Nine of them, in fact, just in Butuan, Philippines alone. Of course, not by these great scholars who aren't actually out there even bothering to search for these, even though Pigafetta recorded such. No, they prefer to remain in willing ignorance. This had to be found by a government worker who happened to be digging. So amazing. Oh yeah, and these ships that were found were guess how long? Just gander a guess. Oh, as long as 82 feet in length. Imagine that. Pigafetta actually could measure quite well. So when a sailing historian tells you how large a boat is, and especially its makeup, perhaps we should believe him, rather than an historian who is probably never even been on a ship. No matter, and this is now being added to textbooks, right? I mean, shouldn't this be taught in every classroom? This is one of the most monumental finds in Philippine history and the very universities that we pay far too much for. Don't even bother with such menial details in some cases. That's sad. No one calling themselves a history teacher nor professor should ever allow a year in any grade to pass without discussing this find. Even if they want to try to dismiss it, they should still be mentioning it. Now, certainly some do. However, we have received probably thousands of messages from viewers who have never heard this before in the Philippines. And that most certainly should not be the case. Very sad, but that's changing. Here's the most significant thing, though. These ships are dated as far back as 320 A.D. Did you hear that? 320 A.D. What were you told of the Philippines in that era? Likely not that they ruled the seas in that era. Hmm. In all of the southeast, really, of Asia. Not as conquerors, because they never were. There's no record of that. But as traders, as business people. Professor Adrian Horridge has done his homework. There's one professor who did well and believes that by 200 BC, Austronesian sailors were regularly carrying cloves and cinnamon to India and Sri Lanka. Somebody better tell Wikipedia who says Sri Lanka is the origin of cinnamon. Hmm, maybe not. And perhaps as far as the coast of Africa in sailboats with outriggers. And you can be certain to add gold, silver, and other resources the Philippines is famous for to that list, especially since gold was found in a dig in Egypt we already covered in the first century. And it is of Philippine origin. How did that get there? These ships. So wait, 200 BC though? Wow. Now, understanding the oldest boat confirmed to date in archaeology is pretty much around 500 B.C., just a little before that era, which, by the way, happens to be a Phoenician vessel. You know, the Phoenicians whom Solomon hired to run his navy. It's really no surprise that Ophir would have picked up on the shipbuilding at some point as well. And a fair point for someone to mention it, Unfortunately, they typically don't actually know this history. In fact, they had enough gold. They could 
have bought a fleet from Solomon, for that matter. To ignore that is really not scholarly, nor academic. So here we go again. Yet another firm, even physical evidence that Ophir is the Philippines, full circle in history and found as a match in archaeology. You won't find that in Ethiopia nor Yemen, not in regards to Ophir, where they stretch stories that never actually fit the Bible from the beginning. But what of these ships? Obviously they found old ones, but would they even be seaworthy? Oh, check this out. Back in 2006, Art Valdez organized the first all-Filipino team to conquer Mount Everest. Having made history once, he now has his sights set on accomplishing a different feat, this article says. Sailing a traditional Belungai all the way to China. The expedition will involve sailing over 800 nautical miles of open sea in boats built using the same methods as those of our ancestors. The Belungai. Now, this is phase one. The final voyage will blow you away. Here it comes. We've lost touch with our heritage as a seafaring people. Yes, that's true. And Valdez says... That began with the colonization of the Spaniards. He reminds us that it was Jose Rizal himself who discovered our rich maritime history when he annotated Antonio de Morga's Successo de las Islas Filipinas. And he did. He went to London and did research. And what did he find there? When the colonials came in here, they saw that the seas were gleaming with craft of different shapes and sizes. It was Pigafetta who wrote about it. This is in his journal. This is what we've been sharing from many times over and will continue to. And every student and every Filipino on earth should read it in its fullness. Well, that's what Valdez says prior to my little dialogue. And he saw that one ship had a hundred rowers on one side, a minimum 50 meters, Ayan. We had shipbuilding before the coming of the colonials. Oh, yes, the Philippines did, and we've already proven it, but we're going to go even further in the next video as the ships get even bigger. Now, this 50 meters long, in shipping terms, boats are measured in feet. 164 feet. Today, we would call that a mega yacht. The second leg saw the Belungai navigate through Southeast Asia through to 2010. So that was four years later. Then Micronesia and Madagascar the following year. And get this. The Belungai then ventured across the Pacific onward to the Atlantic and all the way around the world and back to the Philippines in 2012 and 2013. So these three replicas built in the same fashion after the ancient Belungai not only sailed throughout the southeast but around the world. That is the heritage of the Philippines. The reason it's in the DNA of so many to step up and become merchant marines represents the largest nationality of seamen on the planet, in fact. How does the Philippines keep coming up as a leader in the world in the exact right elements and history matching ancient Ophir? Well, that would be because it is Ophir. Indisputably so. One last note, Pigafetta mentions other vessels of different sizes and shapes indeed. Here are quotes on what he calls a prahu, or what resembles a prahu. Again, he's using terms he's familiar with in describing these ships which are familiar in design. Remember, he's the sailing historian. 
not typically the guys that are commenting and writing articles today. They're not qualified to overrule what Pigafetta said he actually witnessed and wrote. The Filipinos called this boat a Bignadai. I probably said that wrong. And again, these are three references, but he mentions them even more in his journal. However, Pigafetta writes of an even larger vessel. Yep, even larger than an 80-foot Belungai. And we will cover this next. This video will really blow you out of your chair. As we keep saying and supporting over and over again, there is no debating the Philippines is the land of gold in all of history. It is time this knowledge be restored. For those about to comment in ignorance, yep, we always get them. We dare you to watch Solomon's Gold series by The God Culture, the original channel to prove the Philippines is in fact Ophir, and the Garden of Eden, even. Even here we are breaking these into sound bites and clear points, but watch how all 100 clues tie together in history, the Bible, science, geography, language, etc., and this series will blow your mind. Thank you for watching 100 Clues. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell. Like us on our new Facebook, The God Culture Space hyphen space original. If you wish to skip ahead, go to the God Culture YouTube channel and watch their Solomon's Gold series in English or Tagalog. There will be a link on the next screen. We can know this truth and be confident this belongs to the Philippines and no one can disprove it. Until next time.